Hello, friends. Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics podcast. My name is Joe Lynch. Thank you so much for joining us today. On the Logistics of Logistics, I talk to experts in logistics and transportation, warehousing, fulfillment, supply chain, and of course, technology. And during these interviews, I'm always the one asking the dumb questions. I ask the dumb questions so you don't have to. Today's topic is transportation, mergers, and acquisitions with my friend, Spencer Tenney. Spencer is president and CEO of Tenney Group, trusted M&A advisors to the transportation industry. If you want to buy a transportation company or sell a transportation company or learn more about our industry, check out my conversation with Spencer Tenney. How's it going, Spencer? It's going great. Good to be with you, Joe. It is good to have you back on my podcast. You've been on my podcast twice, but the world has changed since we last spoke. Spencer, please introduce yourself and your company where you're calling from today. All right, Spencer Tenney, president and CEO of the Tenney Group out of Franklin, Tennessee. And we are a industry specialized merger and acquisition advisory firm that's been dedicated to transportation logistics since 1973. Very nice. What a crazy coincidence that you're the CEO of a company called Tenny and your name is Tenny. <laughs> I know that just works out, right? <laughs> so what do you guys do uh, at the Tenny Group? Our, our, our primary core focus is sell side representation. And at any given time, we have 15 to 20 different sell side mandates of companies that all transportation logistics, somewhere between 20 to 300 million in annual revenue. And our job is, 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 is quite simply just to make those folks' industry exit as seamless and as rewarding as possible. So sell side means you represent the seller. So if, I have a, a, if I'm a carrier or a freight broker, I have some warehouses, you can help me sell. You can get me that exit, that liquidity event. Right. I, I think that we, we're, we're, it is what it is, right? I, I think that we're in a unique position to to help multiply options, and I think what's a lot of what's very important for a lot of our clients is that they want to have great influence over who the next trustee of their company's legacy is going to be, and 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 that's the position that we want to you know, leverage all of our industry spy, uh, specialized network, fifty years of experience, to try to give them every advantage possible. So you represent sell side. But what about if somebody comes to you and says, Spencer, I want to buy a freight brokerage that specializes in the... I said primarily. Ah, so, okay. okay. <laughs> I, 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 I don't discriminate, but I do think that where we... Uh, traditionally, there's a lot of talent. There's a lot of experience on the buy side of the table where we try to bring values to level up the playing field. And so by doing so, we're also helping the buyers too, because they need the sophistication at the table just as much as the seller does. So by us bringing expertise, experience all around the table, there's just a much higher probability that the deal's actually going to get done. I look at these kind of situations like it's like ladies night. So if you have ladies night, you say, ladies, get in free. You're like, I'm pretty sure the fellas will show up at some point. <laughs> so if you say, I've never I heard an analogy. I might use that moving forward. Okay. Yeah. And so if you say, hey, look, I'm representing a whole bunch of people who want to sell their really good companies and we're positioning to sell, I'm pretty sure the buyers are going to go, I'm looking for a guy like Spencer Tenney. <laughs> so anyway, I talked about the environment changing a lot. How is that? Because we, we talked before we hit record. How has that environment for selling your business changed in the last, let's just say, post-COVID? Obviously, we, we were going through a period of an extended time where debt was effectively free. I think we can agree that season is over. And when you look at 12 plus interest rate hikes over the last call it 15, 18 months, the cost of capital has dramatically increased. But at the same time, we saw the freight market change in, in just as a dramatic fashion. And so all of those things happen simultaneously is not only affected how deals done, it's affected what kinds of deals can get done. And that's where we've been. Let's switch gears for a sec. Tell us a little bit about you. Where did you grow up? Where did you go to school? Give us some career highlights before you started the Tenney Group. I grew up in Arlington, Texas, just right there, Dallas, Fort Worth. And I grew up playing sports, went to the University of Texas after a brief stint playing a little D3 college football at Cornell College. That was an interesting experience. And loved being a Longhorn. I did a number of different things because, you know, what some folks don't know about me is you know, my family's been in transportation for three generations. And so my grandfather drove a beer truck and a taxi in Dallas. My 
My dad was fired by three different trucking companies as a driver, couldn't cut it. So that's why we have so much respect for drivers. But then it went on to own multiple transportation companies, did extremely well, started consulting and ultimately started doing m a advisory back in 73. And I, I was around the, the business and the industry of both transportation and m a and, and really wanted to make my own mark. But even at, at an early age, I had exposure to business owners experiencing the American dream, building something. And, and, and then as a child, you know, seeing their faces and seeing the impact of that my dad was having on their lives. And even as I went on in, in my career, I went into healthcare consulting. I had some experience in music publishing in Nashville, but I just couldn't shake being a part of that. It's a Super Bowl. Once you get a little, a little taste of that, there's nothing really better than helping somebody who has built something special um, and helping them get to that final step where they actually experience the fruit of all that they've worked for. It's a pretty amazing thing. Oh, yeah. And if I could add something, you've been on the podcast before and we talked about this, and I'll put a link to the previous podcast we did. You opened my eyes to some of this through some conversations before on the podcast, but also separately, is that usually this is the biggest transaction of this family's life. When you say, we're going to sell our freight brokerage, or we're going to sell our warehousing company, we're going to sell our carrier. This is not a minor event. A lot of times it's the majority of their net worth. And so this is a make or break transaction, maybe for generations of the family. It's the difference between having a, a great retirement and no retirement. And these don't deals don't always just go well. There's we've the biggest companies in the world that have all these consultants and they say, we bought this company and it's the right fit and it's going to be worth this much more, they often don't fit. They don't work out. And there's a split of some at some point. But on the smaller side, I've heard people, I've had friends who've gone through this. They sell a company expecting this and this is going to happen and it doesn't. And that's, so when somebody says, oh, I don't need this. I'm not just saying this to be a, a, a cheerleader for your business. But when they say, I don't need Spencer or his team to help me, I got this. Yeah, I might pay you a fee, but you will also get me a deal that hopefully is a good one. And you do it all the time. I do it once, maybe twice in my lifetime. Very few people sell two businesses. Yeah. And I think that there's a, I think that's true. What I would say is most every business owner that I've dealt with, it's not a funk, it's not a a technical gap that they're, they're probably have negotiated all kinds of deals. It's that's not the issue. The, the, The challenge is they probably never tried to make a presentation about themselves and their business. That's different than trying to close a deal that you're not directly involved with and maybe have an absence of objectivity. But I think the other part about that is, there's an element of convenience here. What, what buyers are really good at doing is making it so attractive and easy to accept. And the typical seller has no idea what type of concessions or what they're leaving on the table because they're not looking at anything else. And so I think where my passion is seeing and my, my dad, who was entrepreneurial, and I know, and I've seen it my entire life, understanding how much goes into owning and operating a transportation business, a logistics business. And so it's, it's personal for me. I want them to know that they got everything that they could possibly get. And it's just as importantly, like you said, like, like how do you prevent it from going wrong? You need, it's not, it's a two way street. Yes. You're like the buyer's interviewing you, but you need to be screening for the right buyer, not just about the money. You need to be understanding what are you going to do with my business? What are you going to do with my people? And then you lay those post-transaction strategies by buyer side by side. And you say, who is the best candidate, the best trustee to go execute and go deliver what I want to see happen with my business moving forward? And I think when that happens, there's a much higher probability that, of course, the seller is going to get the financial outcome that they want, but they're also going to, to, to see the business thrive into the next chapter. Yep. Yeah. And by the way, I have a son-in-law married to my daughter and he is an investment guy. And for one of his jobs previous, before he started his own firm, he was an investment counselor somewhere. And he and his team would always say, 
it's 90% counselor and 10% investment, meaning <laughs> that so often you are acting as a counselor because as you said, these are not anyone you're working with has done well, but now they're in uncharted territory and there's got to be some vulnerability in it in that they said, look, this is the biggest deal of my life and I can't screw this up. I remember years ago with seeing my mom's and going with my mom to see her investment person. And they said, oh, Marietta, you're a young lady. You, we need to, you need to invest for the future, blah, blah, blah. My mom said, I feel good, but I don't want to go back to work. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Meaning, <laughs> don't get carried away here. <laughs> this is all about it. Right. I, I, I want to be a uh, invest for the future, but I need this to work. Anyway, let's switch gears. Let's talk about transportation and what's going on today. So first off, talk about this very, well, before we hit record, I said, we're in a very different environment than the last time I talked to you. And I said, are, are there different drivers? And you said, no, Joe, there's, they're the same drivers, just different approaches. Please elaborate, educate my audience like you educated me. I, I think that the fundamental drivers, even going back the last, call it five to seven years, are still very consistent. You have an aging demographic of, of business owners who, for the most part, very few have successors in place in terms of the next generation or maybe someone internally. Because the reality is, uh, as the saying goes, this ain't your granddaddy's trucking business or your transportation business. It's just very different. And what it, it what's required to produce a sufficient return on investment, you can go get that in a lot of different places without having millions of dollars on a balance sheet or the stress of constant working capital struggles with a rapidly growing asset light business uh, or brokerage company. It matters about, is the market's changing? All of that tension is, has been the same. The aging demographics, no successors, inflationary costs, increasing cost of capital, driver issues. You can't grow without having the drivers in place. You can't grow without being able to get access to capital. Of course, that was a huge deal in COVID. Some of that still exists. And some of it's just talent. You want to grow your business. It's a very unforgiving space. And so people need and tend to use acquisitions to offset what they don't currently have in talent because it's too expensive to home grow it. And with no assurances that it's going to work any better. So all those things are still in place. And when you squeeze the margins like that, you and you have all the inflationary uh, costs, you have, there's no way to really squeeze any more pennies out of the same dollar. You have to offset that through scale. So that's why we continue to say all the drivers are relatively the same. It's just the the, the, the tools that we can go combat that have, have evolved a little bit with higher interest rates, access to capital and, and various other things. So I think that's a little bit of the, of the environment that we're in that's, that's different. Yep. And you mentioned the aging population. So I am one of the younger baby boomers and the, the most of the baby boomers are past traditional retirement age at this one minute. And the generation behind them, I think is like 400,000 fewer people and in an increasingly wealthy country, um, people have options. I got to think there's a lot of people who said, yeah, my dad started a trucking company. He's done well. It's a difficult business. I've grown up seeing his life. And he said, I want you to go to college. I want you to do this. And I don't want you to have this. Sometimes they go, you know what? It got my blood, like in your case, where you're like, we can't get away from this. We got gas in our blood. Others say, no, I have no interest in running dad's business. And dad knows it. So we, at some point, we have to have that exit. But again, this is... Your kids, my kids have many more options than our generation. And that keeps going. Every generation has more options. So that means more exits. <laughs> and, and in some cases, it's also the founders that are saying, I don't want this for my kids. I may have told you this story. And sometimes there, there's another reason, which this guy called me a while back several years ago. And he's him and Han. And I'm like, hey, what do, hey, hey, John, like, I appreciate the small talk, but hey, what can I do for you? Because I was like, got some things to do here. He's like, all right. I could tell you starting to get more comfortable with me. He said, all right, here's the deal. My son's an idiot. And so <laughs> says, under no circumstances can he take over the business. And so I was like, all right, now I understand that we, we, we can see what we can do about that. And 
it goes the other way too. Sometimes I'll have somebody from at an industry trade event, the son will come up to me and he'll say, I pray every day that I will just get a call or there'll be a press release and I'll find out that you helped my dad sell his company. Never told me about it because then the burden will be off of me and I won't be have to be yes. telling have doing something I really don't want to do. I just don't want to let my family down. Yeah. I think about a restaurant I used to go to. My actually a, fa- a family friend, so known my mom and dad would have been friends with him, and I, I and so generations of connection. And I remember going to this restaurant after the founder died, who would be ninety some years old probably. And and I remember going there with my mom and another friend, and I was like, oh, they've lost a step. And my mom, they lost a lot of steps. And my brother's like, hey, I don't think we're coming back here. And I was thinking about it after I left and I was thinking the guy who started that business is long dead. It was his passion. It was his fourth child, right? He loved that and he grew that and he put his heart and soul into that to assume that your kids want to be in that same business is a bad assumption. And, and by the way, you might say, well, my kids not doing anything else. They're not making any money. I'll bring them in. You found your way, <laughs> they'll find their way. And it's, and I think it's especially true if you say I have three or four kids or two kids, doesn't matter how many kids, and one wants to take it over and the other doesn't, you're almost better off saying, let's exit it. And the one who wants to go start a brand new company like this. The other one, do whatever you want with the money when I'm gone. <laughs> this is a, a topic I'm pretty passionate about Joe, just because I'm a product of it. There was, yeah, you lived uh, it. <laughs> so I'm a big advocate when it makes sense, when everybody in the family wants that internal transfer of ownership. I love that. I love when I see that. I love if I can be a part of encouraging it. Sometimes it's, it's not always in the cards, but I, where I see families doing a really good job of stewarding the relationships within the family, but also positioning the business to, to thrive, which is very difficult balancing act. The things that they do different from other families is that they speak to one another like adults, not family members. And they speak to each other like about professionals. And so the, what they do is they open up the facts about the business. This is what the business is worth. Some of these kids in the business, I say kids, like the next gen. They could be 45 years old and they're right. treated like a kid. <laughs> but they've never really had access or felt the full weight of what ownership is and had access to the balance sheet and understood when there is tremendous strain on cash flow. They never felt that weight. So to assume that they want that, but they've also never really understood that if they worked hard, if they did certain things to enhance the business, what could the business be worth and how might that affect your own personal net worth should you take on the risk of being a business owner? And in, in the families that I see doing this, number one, a lot of good things can happen. One, you will expedite what might be a 10-year process of tiptoeing around and not trying just trying to be polite with one another. Get the facts out the table, educate one another about this is what it is. Do you want it or not? And if so, here are the responsibilities that are required. And in doing that, there's a much better chance that you're going to get authentic feedback from one another about what you both want from the business and what you don't want. And so at that point, you can either pivot to getting towards another successor or moving to the open market. Or what might happen is you get clarity and help act the successor and unleash some extraordinary potential that you didn't know was there within the family. And so, but in the absence of that information, it's almost impossible to, like I said, steward the relationships that you care about the most, but also avoid this situation where you're just going to put the business in a state of paralysis and, and nobody's going to win. Yep. Yep. And guys, we, we all personally know people who've grew up in a family business and the family sold the business or they took it over there is a lot of challenges. And I also, so you mentioned not being able to see your kids objectively or the, the kids being able to see their parents objectively. That's, again, I think this is why you need a third party involved. This is, I'm a, I have an executive coach in home. She sees things in me plain as day that I don't see. And she says, why don't you do this? And I was like, why didn't I come up with that? Why didn't I already know that? Because I can't see me objectively. 
Thank God. <laughs> but before we hit record, we were talking about 2024 trends. We're already here in November. What are some 2024 M&A trends we should be looking at? By the way, that's mergers and acquisitions for anyone who's not aware. What should we be looking at in the transportation and warehousing space for 2024? I think we've already seen the tremendous amount of pressure where folks have just closed doors and shut it down. I think that when you have that time, of, <laughs> yeah, it, it, and there's a lot of folks who have battled well, who have maintained performance. It's just extremely difficult. So what we're expecting as a firm is there's a lot of folks that had done everything that they possibly can who function at an elite level, but are realizing that their energies and that their capital could be deployed into a different investment instrument and, and, and outperform what they're doing right now. So we think that there's going to be folks that are just going to re redeploy capital towards something other than what they're doing right now. And it's going to be many small to lower middle market type transactions. That's going to happen in that profile. And then same thing on the asset heavy side, where when you have the, the, the cost of financing that have gone up so high, the only options are, like I said, you, you're going to have to double down and grow via acquisition to offset those those things because you, you're you not going to be able to raise rates to uh, keep pace with what the inflationary expenses are. So the only way to offset that is going to be through acquisition. So people are going to have, they're going to be at a crossroads. They're going to have to make a choice. Either I'm going to double down and, and do something that I haven't done via acquisition, which by the way, they can do. It's it, People are new buyers are entering the market and they're successfully growing via acquisition at, at a rapid rate. And so be encouraged by that. And so some folks are going to say, I know I can do it. I know I probably should do that, but I don't want to do that. This is my stepping off point. And so I, for that reason, we're expecting, there was a lot of activity that was pushed forward because we had month over month freight market losses. And so we're, we're, we're going to see a significant amount of that activity pushed into 2024. And we're optimistic that a lot of folks are going to completely change the trajectory of where they were headed because some of these market pressures are going to force them to make a much better and sustainable business. And we think that's something to be excited about. Yep. Am I right to say that there's been a maybe that I see stuff on LinkedIn, I read stuff from freight waves and other sources, and it seems as if there's a lot of companies over time, they might have started as a asset based trucking company. And at some point they opened a brokerage and then they just say, I'm out, I'm going to sell the trucking company, but we're going to keep the brokerage side. Are you seeing a lot of that? that? That's what I see anecdotally. I do. Where I see it most is if that brokerage has some type of niche expertise that they're doing that has some insulation from the market. Because if, if not, yeah, you get rid of the assets, but you have just as much exposure uh, in the marketplace, unless you have some type of expertise um, that's insulated from that. So I think that where you see people, the reason why people were getting the brokerage, because it was a hedge, you, you had more control over how you produce profits. Now, if you get rid of the assets, you lose the hedge. And the same, <laughs> so I think that's where you're seeing folks that if they're completely cutting off the asset heavy side, it's because they have solidified their position that they have insulation from swings in the market. And it's because they have some type of niche expertise. Yep. I want to talk a little bit about what the buyers are looking for. So I know the buyers come to you because you are representing a lot of sell side people in addition to some buy side people. When companies come to you, what are they looking for in say a broker or a 3PL? What are they looking for business wise? On my podcast, I did a recent interview with Blue Jay Capital, they purchased a, a, a large, very profitable final mile company called Priority Courier Experts. And I asked him a similar question. And the answer was, it started with the management team. Because if you want private equity money, they're not interested in managing anything. They want e elite leaders at that management team that have a, his words were, they have a growth mindset, which is they're the engine. They're the ones that want to drive the growth. And then the private equity group behind it's just providing the fuel. So the absence of that is a non-starter. You get the experienced management team that has the capabilities to four or five X what you're currently doing, but more importantly, have a burning desire to go execute. And that's why, you know, in most deals with private equity, they're trying to 
have some type of roll forward equity for that management team that allows them to participate in that upside uh, to go execute. But those are, but, but that's the main characteristics of what they're looking for. And, and of course, the second thing, uh, or, or maybe a tie for first would be they need a compelling growth story that kind of captures the imagination of the buyer, because without that, this is a very unforgiving industry. So if you're trying to sell, if you're a buyer and you're trying to sell to your lender about why we should be underwriting this deal, they need to see a very compelling growth story so that when there's an inevitable bump in the market, this is the type of business that will be able to sustain themselves through that because they have a very strong growth strategy. So those are the two main things that we see buyers looking for. Yeah. Earlier, we were talking about this generational either handoff or selling the the company. If I'm looking and saying I'm running out of gas and I don't think my kids want to take it over or I don't think they're qualified or it's too big of a risk for me personally to sell my business, which I value heavily. And they, I've been doing it for 40 years. And now when I hand it off to my kids, what if they squander? I don't know way to say it, squander. If they, they don't have the same expertise, the markets gets more and more unforgiving. What if they go out of business with my retirement and their future? So I don't think you can have this mindset of I'm running out of gas. It's time to call Spencer. It has to be, I'm at the top of my game. Things are still going well. And I've got a great story and I got a great team because the time to say, I'm going to build a great story, uh, a compelling market story. And I build a great team. Isn't uh, three weeks before I call Spencer to sell. That doesn't work. I have to be able to say, I developed the next generation of leaders and I don't have me personally, the founder, the founding team doesn't have to be here to, to run the next, next 10 years. Yeah. I'm reminded of a story. We had a client and I talked several times, maybe several months leading up to them, their team engaging us, but I hadn't met him in person yet. And we were having a, a meeting with the buyer and I didn't know for sure. I suspected that there might be some health issues. So we'd already agreed to terms in principle. We had to iron out a couple of details, but we show up to this dinner. And I, I, I had arranged to meet my client about 30 minutes beforehand, just to spend some time with one another. And my client rolls in. He is in a wheelchair. He has an oxygen tank, audibly wheezing. And I just said, we're in trouble. We are in trouble. Because the the spirit of the agreement was that the owner would be around for maybe a year to support whatever was needed. There was no debt. There was not really any management team. And as you might be guessing, yeah, we had that meeting and everyone was very cordial and polite. But the next day, the, the offer was dramatically reduced because, according to the buyer, that the, the risk, the post-transaction risk of the owner being able to stay healthy and actually support a deal. Like it didn't look like he was going to be able to make it out of the restaurant that night. He was in a bad right. way. Right. And so, so the buyer, like, it's not like he, he wasn't necessarily, it wasn't malicious. It was just like the risk profile for the deal changed dramatically. I got eyes on. It. And so you know, the, 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 the deal is this is for those that are trying to be a good steward of, 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 of navigating this process uh, number one, as we had talked about it, it it's your, your ideal timeline is almost never going to align with when the right buyer is in front of you. So to get out in front of that, you always want to be in a position to say no. So what if you go to the market and you just don't like what you're experiencing? Fine. Keep trucking. Do what you got to do to get in yourself in position to find the right buyer. The opposite of that is what a lot of folks do is they get into a place when they know their back's against the wall and they have to do something and either one, they don't get a deal done, or number two, they do a horrible deal with someone that they don't like, that they do not have shared values with, and and they're sore about it for the rest of their existence. We're coming from weakness also, because yeah. if their choice was, we're either going to go out of business or sell. And I don't think you can look at it that way. I think you have to look at it as, we have to be at the top of our game when we, so we can say no. So we can say, we're looking for really good offers, not we're desperate and in a hurry because the founder is sick or the, our business is way down. Before we hit record, we are talking about the need to partner up. And I think previous podcasts I did with you, 
we talked about this idea of if I'm going to sell in a few years, let's just say I'm a small trucking company and I've got three terminals, but I don't use one very much. And I've got a, a, a team when I've got my uh, some people who've hung around with me for a while who aren't adding the value. Maybe my brother-in-law who's half retired, right? That you have not positioned it for sale. And maybe, maybe the, you don't even, you're so used to it, that just becomes the norm. But then when I, if I was to get you involved and you say, hey, Joe, why don't you sell that one terminal and put that money in, in your bank <laughs> or invest it somewhere else in the business? And let's get the right people on board. And so in a year or two years, you're positioned to sell this. I think I'm so much better off than saying, hey, <laughs> Spencer, I'm not doing so well. My my son quit. My health is failing. <laughs> Help me. And, and you look and go, oh, and your website's 12 years old. And you don't have any niche. <laughs> you don't have a leadership team and it's too late to build one. Yeah. I, I think that there's two things to take away from what that kind of anecdote that you just said. Like number one, a lot of folks who get in that situation go into, how do I get into this situation? I can't get out. This is a horrible, I can't believe I allowed this to happen to me. In reality, sometimes like life happens. You can't do anything about it. But in more times than not, you have, you have, more to offer a buyer than you currently realize. Even if you're losing money, look at the convoy deal. Here it is. Like convoy shuts their doors down, losing money hand over fist, but still find a buyer for a certain asset with the business with Flexport. And so that's my encouragement to folks. No matter how you got here, don't ever assume that someone won't or isn't valuing something that you have, be it your trucks, be it your drivers, be it uh, maybe the talent that you have on, on the team. It could be your customers. I mean, you might have a customer that provides an access point that allows that same buyer to 10x the business that's currently coming through that one customer. So number one, like however you got there, don't beat yourself up about it, but take ownership and do something about it because there's a good chance you might have something to offer buyers. So just don't make any assumptions. Yeah. And the other part about that is even if like sometimes it's, you don't want to like, hey, I don't, I can't sell because I have to overly prepare. Sometimes a buyer has a such a pronounced pain. Whatever's going on in your business that's imperfect doesn't matter. Whatever the time that you would invest to try to polish it, it's not near enough to like based on what the value that you offer to to solve this problem today. I had a, a client a, a while back that just to, to run the mill twenty five million dollar drive in carrier was approached by a buyer whose offers on the table doesn't engage because it was inconvenient. He had a daughter that was getting married. Comes to me, says, what do I think of the offer? I says, it's fantastic. I can't do any better than this. Have you accepted this? And he says, shelved it because I got tied up. Turns out he had shelved it for six months. And I said, oh, you got to be kidding me. Go hang up the phone. Go get that buyer to see if he'll still honor this offer. And so he goes and he runs him down. We, we huddle up two weeks later. It turns out like, well, he's still interested, but he's not interested at that price because he already went and solved that problem through another acquisition oh. while he was on the shelf. So that that offer for that $25 billion top line revenue was reduced by $7 million. Think about that type of money for that size profile of a business owner. That's life changing generational money. And so it wasn't convenient. He, he was thinking that maybe I should try to dress this up along the way. Didn't matter. Like nothing that he would have done could have ever replicated the amount of money that was available because it was a solve for a very specific problem at that moment in time. So to me, it's just, like, it's just the recognition that if someone knocks on your door and they're ready to transact, like you got to be ready to go, irrespective of how unpolished the business is, because the reason why they're knocking on your door is you are a problem to their, you are a solution to their problem. And that's probably worth more than anything that you can do to enhance the business between now and whenever you were thinking about selling. So from beginning to end, how long does it take, let's just say, to sell a company? And you can give me some ranges here because I'm sure bigger companies take longer, but, and I know it's faster if they get engaged with a company like yours, but how long from the time I say, I think I want, I'm, I think I'm open to an offer till the time we ink a deal. And then I think then how much longer do I got to hang around with the business? <laughs> Yeah, you know, great question. It really just depends on how educated the seller is 
before going to the market. And then the, the size and the complexity of the deal. On average, uh, for, the, for the size companies that we typically work with, somewhere between, call it eight and 12 months, is generally where it's going to fall. And you could come to terms within, call it 30 to 45 days from signing an engagement letter and beginning the process. But where you, where, what takes the longest is satisfying all of the third parties that have to bless the deal in order for the seller to get paid. There's, there's certain things in terms of the due diligence process, easy 90 to 120 days after you've had reached an agreement on the economic terms of the deal. If you have any other snags or any hiccups in performance along the way, that can add more time. And so that's, that's why it's important. The more that you educate about yourself about the process, then you can back in and reverse engineer when you should actually start it. When do I want to be experiencing? Because like you said, okay, that's how long it's going to take. If I should build in another year on top of that to have some type of consulting or support for the deal for the new buyer, if I'm not working full time. Well, then add that to uh, the timeline to reverse engineer it. So whenever you want to be on the beach with your beautiful bride or your spouse or whoever else, and you want to be experiencing more time with grandbabies, well, envision that moment in time. And then you need to build in the extra time so that you're not late to your own party. Yeah. And do you work with companies way in advance of them selling? I know you do talk to certain people, and I'm assuming that's your preference is to say, call me now when you, you want to be out in five years. Let's get to know each other right now. And I can, I'm can. i assuming you advise them on what they should be doing in preparation for that eventual sale. Yeah, we, we do. And, and, and one of the things that I really enjoy doing is, um, now I'll hear this a lot of times from clients. They'll say, nobody talks to me like you talk to me. And this is true of most every business owner because you're the guy. And whatever, whatever I say goes. That stops here. <laughs> but very few business owners have anybody in their life that will challenge the rationale of what they're saying. So they're saying, Hey, I want to do this. I want to build this value. And I'll say, I'll have people that say, I want to go double. I want to go add 500 trucks. And I'll say something like, okay, tell me how that's going to make your life better. I'm happy to go do it for you, but you tell me how that's going to make your life better. And do you know what, what's going to be required of you to go do that? And then what I take great pride in is forcing business owners to back up their own beliefs. This is what I believe is going to be true. Uh, And the other part of it is they'll say something to me like, I'm ready. I'm done. I've had it. And I'll say, John, you've been doing this for 20 years. I know you love this. If I go solve this problem, are you telling me you still want to sell the business? And they'll say, no, you go solve this problem for me. Then uh, yeah, no, I don't want to sell this business. So I I think what's key is business owners need to have, not just with, with us, but they need to have trusted advisors around their table that will tell them the truth and then will call them on their stuff so that they can get the, the most important work that needs to get done, whether that's creating value or whether that's having an honest conversation about, no, I'm not willing to do what's required. I need to take my chips off the table so that my people that help me build this thing have a chance to thrive under different ownership. And I think that's the key. Yeah. But it, it somewhat reminds me about going to the doctor. So after COVID, I didn't see, I didn't get a physical for a while during COVID. I don't think, any, I don't think anybody did, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I was thinking, oh man. I gained some weight sitting around drinking sangria and eating corn chips like I was on vacation. And I should have gone to the doctor. And then I didn't. I was like, I got to lose some weight. I got to get to the gym. So I worked out and I, I was telling my, all my friends, I'm like, I'm cramming for a test, not having anything to drink, <laughs> no sweets, no, no. And I went to the doctor just hoping that he'd say, yeah, you're still in great health, Joe. And I went and he goes, oh, I haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, all your tests came back good. But ever since I was a few months ago, and, I, and I'm happy, obviously good news is good news. But it occurred to me, what if uh, I had the beginnings of some bad disease? And it would be and it would show up in the blood work a year ago. And I didn't go because I wanted to cram for that physical, right? I wanted to. And that's what we do. I have friends who are state planning lawyers, and they say, They'll always tell you a horror story about somebody who just didn't want to talk about it because it's unpleasant. It's not easy to go, yeah, I'm going in and talking about the end of my life or me being in a nursing home. No one wants to do that. I didn't want to go to the doctor. I was in good health. I didn't want to go to the doctor. You're that same guy. 
if if I'm walking around telling myself I'm going to sell my business for forty million dollars and it's going to be everyone wants it, it's going to be a bidding war. And then I call Spencer, and Spencer says, oh, "Dude, let's come back to Earth. Your business is worth no more than thirty million. By the way, still a nice chunk of change. <laughs> but and here's what you need to do to get there. Then it's reality check. And by the way." If he's saying that to his wife, I hope so. And maybe she's not part of the business. If he's saying it to his employees, they're like, I don't know. I'm not going to argue with the boss. You are the reality check. <laughs> yeah. And and I think that what ends up happening, like when we start having developing relationships with folks, they just you just aren't able to talk about things that maybe you hadn't had a, had a place to direct those types of questions to, whether it's about, hey, what do I do? To your point about wealth management, I want to give abundantly. I've always dreamed about this. Like, how do I do that? And like, how do I approach that? And how do I think about timing my business sale based off these other commitments that I've made to nonprofits and charities and things that I that are dear to my heart? Like, those are things that we can help navigate through to, to manage risk according to a broad scope of goals that you're trying to address. And so I, I think those are the main things that we're, we're, we're trying to do and we're not the one-stop shop, but I do think that where we try to bring value to folks is that as an industry specialized firm that's deeply connected in this space, we almost have a guy for everything that there is in this <laughs> industry. So like I said, when people say I want to sell and I said, what's the problem or what's the issue? Why I've, I'm done because of this problem. The first thing that we're going to do is let me introduce this person. And he's the best of the best at solving this problem. If he can't do it, I'll help you. But you're going to need to convince me if he fixes that problem that you still want to sell. But the point is, this is a wonderful industry. It's extremely unforgiving. And the key that, as I say all the time, the key to building and protecting business value in this industry is you have to stay agile and you have to stay educated at all times. That's just that, that's it. There's just no possible way to just head down and grind without taking a beating in this space. You have to keep your head on a swivel. You have to continually grow your network of contacts and challenge yourself with people that are going to push back on you. Yep. By the way, I've learned this myself and I talk to a lot of other podcasters. I talk to people in this space. I try and understand what's going on because what I realize is the stuff that I write in my journal, the stuff that I, the thoughts that I wander around with in my head are so often wrong. And if I've been if I've been building a great company with employees who count on me and making payroll for 25 years in a row and building this, you know, I'll call it a legacy, I don't think very objectively about it. I think very subjectively. I have thoughts in my head from my childhood that no longer make sense. And I need outside counsel. I need somebody to give me a reality check. And I have... I, I keep coming back to that because I, I realize I'm an executive coach for the same reason. I need a reality check. I say something and she goes, that's not right. Oh, all right. Tell me why it's not right. No one else tells me that's not right. <laughs> Agreed. We, we all need that in our lives for, for multiple reasons. Anyway, I like to interview smart, interesting people like you, Spencer, rock stars in our space. People are killing it. Who else should I interview? Oh, I've been extremely impressed. We do a lot of seminars on how to be an elite acquirer. And to me, if you're going to be in this space, you need to be acquiring. And two leaders, thought leaders, I guess you'd say, within this space, people that we've recently done transactions with that I think are um, very elite in this area, all the things that make a great acquirer. Uh, one of those would be Matthew Decker from a uh, U.S. multimodal. They were right. involved in a deal we recently sold. Just his demeanor, approach, soft skills around getting a, a deal done was tremendous. I think he's a, he's a great resource to unpack how to, how to be that effective and be a prolific acquirer in this space. And same goes for Pierre uh, Mathieu from Blue Jay Capital. Yeah, they were involved in, in, in acquiring priority courier experts, actually oh, wow. strategic a strategic investment actually is what it was uh, in conjunction with Trident Private Equity Group. But Pierre was masterful in that deal, navigating and trying to get 
the interest of a lot of parties in a line as we were doing the same thing. But Pierre was in a challenging position to, to get that deal done and was exceptional. So I think he has a lot to offer to teach other buyers on how to be an effective acquirer, particularly in this particular freight market. No, I love it. I would love to interview Matthew and Pierre. I, while you're saying that, it occurred to me being that great buyer, and I know you're the, the middleman, match.com for people in the transportation logistics space. But um, it occurred to me, you're an authentic guy. You, can, I, I, I've known you for a while. I can trust you. But it occurs to me that as I'm, if I'm selling my company, I need to get the right vibes from these. These guys, Matthew, Pierre, have to have an authenticity to them and a values where you go, I, I get it. This guy likes my business. Our values align. It's not just a transactional thing because we're going to be joined at the hip for a minute. And this, again, the biggest transaction of my life, I'm not going to work with somebody who I don't get the right vibes from. No, I, I spoke on this a couple of weeks ago. There was a study, I think it was in the Princeton Review, which said that the uh, the, the typical human needs precisely three seconds to size up whether or not they want, whether they like somebody, whether they want to do business with them. And for those of your audience who are thinking about growing through acquisitions, you need to be mindful of, are you putting your best foot forward with the most highly relational, use your language, vibey, puts off a good vibe and a good energy that people are attracted to? Because if you're not, it might be done before you even put your terms out in front of them because they don't like you. And so I think that's where a lot, and I joke around with other business owners, I'm saying, hey, you're not near as charming as you think you are. You need to substitute, you need to get somebody else leading your acquisition efforts because, and I'm doing that kind of tongue in cheek, but the science is undeniable. Like you have to lead with your most, your most reliable and most gifted socially person that you have on your team. And by the way, you, you do this, you're a great interview. Thank you for being on my podcast. But one of the things I've I said it all the time before we hit record is when I interview people like you, I want them to first get to know and trust you. Because if they can get to know and trust you, and you're easy to get to on that. And I, and part of that is being authentic, telling your story in a way that you go, oh, okay, I want to be part of this guy's story. This is interesting. I want to be part of his group. Then I want that my guests to be seen as the recognized industry expert. If they can get to know and trust you, see that guy and say, he solves the problem that I have and I know and trust him. We are golden. And then the last thing I always say, and we'll do it right now is plug, plug. We can plug at the end. They already know, like, and trust you, Spencer. They know you're a recognized <laughs> industry expert. Now we can plug. I always call it the good night kiss. Good night kiss would have been really weird at the beginning of this, <laughs> but it might make sense at the end. <laughs> and so to that end, what I'll do is I'll put a link a link to your LinkedIn profile. I'll also put a link to your website. Any other links, if you have white papers, anything you want to share, we'll put those in the show notes. So one more time, who is your sweet spot and what problem do you solve for them? Yeah. So the thing that we're unique and differ from any other M&A advisory investment bank, we primarily focus on sell-side advisory for business owners of 20 to 300 million in annual revenue and only trucking logistics. And so that's where we're trying to serve a highly underserved business owner group. And that's where we're bringing the most value. And so the best way to learn about that and, and, and begin developing a relationship with us is at thetinnygroup.com or to just follow me personally on LinkedIn, where we'll pump out a lot of free content and videos that will make you a much more equipped buyer, seller, or advisor to, to, to those same folks. Also... You have a new podcast. I'm going to be on it. So t- tell us what's the name of your podcast. Yeah. So it's not too new. It sneaks up, but we're, I think we're approaching about 130 episodes. Oh, on the wow. Hot All right. So not so new. Good. Yes. No, I, we try to make a point to, to learn from the, the greatest thought leaders that we can in the space and then weave in what's the connection to M&A. And so I'm excited about having you on there, Joe. And, and so it's in the hot seat with the Tenny Group. We'll typically take 20, 30 minutes and we'll see if you can take the heat. I think that's the whole point. We'll see what happens. Yes, sir. You guys got to go easy on me. <laughs> it's light and airy over here. <laughs> so it's it's the, in the hot seat with this. In the hot seat. That's right. So what if you could give me a link to that and I'll put it in the show notes and uh, so people can check it out. And I, I love what you're doing. I think it's I think it's so important as and, and, and I'm a small business owner myself is 
And when I go for a walk every once in, uh, in the morning, I'll go for a walk. And every once in a while, I'll say, when am I? Will I sell this business? Will it just go out of business? Will I hand it off? And they're always a little vague, right? And uh, it occurred to me when I was talking to you today, I was like, yeah, you got to get a little more finite about that kind of thing. You have to start it's the biggest investment most people have. You better get a little serious about it. And if you think writing it down in your journal or thinking about it when you're driving around is enough, I don't think it is. No, I think, and there's some concrete things. We've got some white papers, I think, that can be helpful. And it's all over our website as well. So if you're just taking some initial steps about what am I going to do? How do I create value so something's actual sellable? Please tune into those those white papers. And I think that'll get you at least asking the right questions and start having some tangible things you can go activate. Yeah. And next time we, next time I have you on my podcast, I'm going to say, what is the longest that a, a podcaster can hang around? Is it 80, 85? I don't, I don't want to be a Senator in this. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if you're uh, continuing to check those three boxes that you just went over a minute ago, then I don't know why you would stop. Exactly. All right, Spencer, thank you so much for taking the time. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Same here, Joe. And thank all of you for listening to my podcast. Your support's very much appreciated. Until next time, onward and upward. You have been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage with leaders in the logistics and supply chain community. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, hit the like button, and leave us a nice review on Apple or Spotify or wherever else you listen. Also, please check out our videos on YouTube and Connect with us on LinkedIn. We're very big on LinkedIn. And you can also reach us on the logisticsoflogistics.com, our website.